God, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for your word, um, Father, that is true and that we can trust. And so, um, Father, I pray that we would um, look to it tonight to guide us, um, to lead us, and to um, walk with us. Father, we love you. We're grateful for how much you love us. Um, may we glorify and honor you tonight. Let me pray. Amen. Well, um, probably already done with Proverbs if you've been reading week to week, but <laughs> Proverbs 15 and 16, um, <clears throat> just chapters, Proverbs 15 and 16, you know, it's uh, interesting. I said we would kind of highlight some things. Uh, Proverbs 15, you know, it starts with a soft answer turns away wrath, but a, a harsh word stirs up anger. Uh, we've talked about that um, verse specifically within this um, class, but um, uh, how many times have you seen that to be true, right? <laughs> right when you're when you're calm and you are kind to someone, um, over when you're harsh and mean to someone, like their response is entirely different. Um, and so you know so much of that. But then 15 goes on and um, says at the very end of 15 it says. In verse 33, the fear of the Lord is instruction and wisdom, and humility comes before honor. Um, we can all look at that and go, yep, we've seen that happen over and over, haven't we? Um, and, and then um, 16 starts with, the plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. Um, and then, um, and so you just, it, really, ultimately what 15 and 16 are boiling down to is what? It's the Lord's instruction that gives us wisdom. Right? And, and what an incredible different wor word that is for the world we live in, isn't it? Like I was even having a conversation t today with a, with, a, with a gentleman I had a meeting with and um, uh, talking about deconstruction and talking about all of these things that are happening in our world. And, and it boils down to all of the, because we even talked about like all the people that are um, furries. You know, have you, you've seen that where like people think they're cats, things like that. And it's just like it boils down to this is that people have begun to believe that everything they think in their mind is absolute truth. Like what they think, what they dream up is true. When Proverbs 15 and 16 is literally saying what? The instruction of the Lord is wisdom. Like when we seek the instruction of the Lord, that's where wisdom takes place. That's where we understand. Um, and then in, um, at, the, at the end of chapter um, 16, verse 31 is, is awesome. Gray hair is a crown of glory. Yes. It is gained in a righteous life. I was like, I know, Sean, I thought the same thing. I was like, well, mine's not going to get a chance to turn gray, so this is not fair. But my beard's kind of gray, so maybe that's my son. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> anyway, so that's, that's Proverbs 15 and 16. And on your schedule, you can continue um, reading through as we jump in. So, all right, so when I say the word fast or fasting, What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Not eating. I can't eat. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Any, anybody else? Is that, that's the, immediately the first thing that comes to our mind is not eating. Well, that is a specific definition, and that's really what the Bible talks about. Uh, but if we look at a broader definition, um, I love what Martin Lloyd-Jones says here, is that it's the abstinence from anything that is legitimate in and of itself for some spiritual purpose, right? So, so we can fast from a lot of things, um, can't we? Right? And we fast from things that, um, let's just talk about this. What are some things that, that take our attention away from the Lord? Your phone automatically, right? Technology. Um, 
our kids. No, I can't fast for my kids. Uh, but <laughs> that's called vacation. But, um, <clears throat> where they stay here. So, but <laughs> things that take our attention away from that which is priority or should be priority, right? Uh, when we uh, specifically abstain from those things, um, that is a fast, right? But um, for specific and for this study, we're talking about the definition uh, of fasting as a voluntary absence from physical nourishment, food and drink for special spiritual purposes. And so we are going to focus in on that um, uh, tonight. And so, um, so Old Testament fasting, right? So happened in Old Testament, it happened in the New Testament, um, but I want us to see it in, in Leviticus chapter 16, um, verse 29, we, we see that Israel fasted on the day of atonement. And so uh, verse 29, it says this, and it shall be a statute to you forever that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict yourselves and you shall do no work, either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you. And this word afflict is, is to fast, to, to deny yourself of these things. And so um, what is the Day of Atonement, right? The, the Day of Atonement in, uh, in Israel's history um, is they also oftentimes will say Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement. It's the day in which all of Israel atoned for their sins. They brought sacrifices, and they, they still do this. They still practice the Day of Atonement. Um, it's that day that's set aside in which they um, bring all of their, um, they bring their sacrifices to sacrifice for their sins all year long, right? So the, the Day of Atonement, um, they fasted on that day. So um, typical in Old Testament times, even in New Testament times, a typical fast, now not always, and we're going to talk about this, but a typical fast from them was sun up to sundown, right? Because in their minds, that's how, that's, that was a completion of a day, right? So sun up to sundown was a completion of a day um, in the Jewish culture and mindset. And so their fast was typical from sun up to sundown, okay? Um, uh, and so uh, you see Israel fasting on the Day of Atonement. You also see um, that, that after the exile, so um, after Israel, the Jewish people were exiled out of their land, right? And, um, and uh, we see that there's four other um, fasts were observed um, in Zechariah. So somebody want to look up Zechariah? All right, Zechariah 8.19. Read that one, Logan. So this is what the Lord Almighty says. The, the fast of the fourth, fifth, seventh, and tenth month will become joyful and glad occasions and happy festival for Judah. And therefore, love, truth, and peace. Yeah. So we see that there's four more um, fasts that were observed for specific months, right? Um, and so they would fast. And, and even that text even tells you they're, they're what? Fasting was, was for what? Did you catch it? Joy. Joy. Yeah. Joy and celebration. When you think of abstaining from food, do you think of joy and celebration? Come on. I do not. No. <laughs> like, I mean, that's not. After the fact. Yeah, when I get to eat again <laughs> at the buffet. But um, <laughs> but it was it was that, right? It was it was it was a joyous and celebratory time. And we're gonna talk about that in, in a little bit. Um, and then individuals or the nations would fast for specific, specific circumstances. So we see in the Old Testament, and we also see in the New Testament, is that individuals would fast by themselves, but then the whole nation would fast as well. Um, I have I already looked up 2 Samuel 12, 22. Somebody look up Judges 20, verse 26. Second Samuel twelve, twenty two says this. He said, "While the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live?" 
Um, this is in reference when David um, um, gets Bathsheba pregnant and then the baby is born and the baby dies. So when the baby was still alive, David individually does what? He fasts in hopes that the child will live, right? And so there's a specific circumstance in which we see someone in the Old Testament, an individual by himself, fasting um, in hopes of. And so we're going to talk about what that means. Um, and then somebody read Judges 20, verse 26. Anybody got it? Chapter 20, verse 26. Okay. You got it? Then all the people of Israel, the whole army, went up and came to Bethel and wept. They sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until evening and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. Yeah. So we see uh, literally a whole army of Israel fasting before the Lord um, and weeping before the Lord. Um, and so we, we see these specific things um, taking place because of whatever's happening. Um, and so I want us to see this too because it's interesting is that... Um, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, fasting was just part of what they did. Where for us, fasting is not part of our culture, right? And so when we talk about how we fast, uh, we're going to talk about that and just hopefully we get there. But um, we talk about how we fast, we have to be intentional with it. Because for them, culturally, it's just what they did. Right? Fasting, fasting um, in, in Jewish culture, it was not only happened in Jewish culture, it happened in other cultures that are surrounded them. So it was just part of a, a way of life for them that they would fast um, to put their focus on um, the Lord. Okay? And so we see that for specific circumstances. Fasting was an expression of the heart. Um, if, you, if we look at 2 Samuel um, chapter 1, uh, verse 12, it says this. And they mourned and wept, fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan his son, and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. Right? Um, Saul, who is the king of Israel, right? dies and his son dies with them and what does scripture say this is an expression of the heart they fasted in their grief and in their mourning um, it's an expression of, 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 of grief of what is going on around us We're going, our response is going to be to weep and to fast um, and then we look in Daniel if we look, flip over to Daniel <clears throat> Daniel chapter 9, starting in verse 3. Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleased for mercy. With fasting and sackcloth and ashes, I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and, rule, and rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets who spoke in your name, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us open shame, as this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Israel, Jerusalem, and to all Israel. Those who are near and those who are far away in all the lands in which you have driven them because of the treachery that they have committed against you. And so we see that Daniel's fasting for patience before the Lord. He's fasting um, as an act of um, I must lament as well as, Lord, you are awesome, and, and we're going to wait on you and wait for what you do, right? Um, and then we see humility um, in Ezra. Somebody look up Ezra. Somebody got a phone? Or somebody get their Bible? Ezra 8.21. Yep, 
Ezra 8, 21. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava, <clears throat> that they might be humbled, that we might humble ourselves before our God, to seek Him a safe journey for ourselves, our children, and all our goods. Humility, right? That we may humble ourselves before the Lord. Um, and then that leads into the fifth thing of Old Testament fasting is fasting was to gain the guidance of God. And that's the Ezra passage again, right? Um, is that may, that we may know, right, what God desires, that we may know um, what God's plan is, is that fasting leads to that. Um, whenever I was in college, um, my friends in college, it was part of our college ministry, um, I... <coughs> Um, our college minister had each one of us teach a section of a book called um, The Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. Richard Foster was a, is a, is a Quaker, um, so think Puritan, right? And he wrote this book called The Celebration of Discipline, and it's a fantastic book. Um, but our college minister selected like 10 of us, and each one of us had to teach a chapter every Sunday night. Um, and so I, um, I taught on... Um, I don't even remember now, but it really wasn't that impressive. So, um, but I will say this: that he 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 selected a uh, one of the one of our one of the girls that was in our college ministry to, to teach on fasting, and the reason he did is because he knew their family story, and her dad's a pastor, and um, he just felt like their their church was was building a new building. Um, they desperately needed it because they had um, some structural things of their current building that they could not. Um, it was it was cheaper just to tear the building down and start over. Um, but they were a fairly small church and could not afford to build a new building. But they were kind of in this rough place, right, this really hard place. Because um, they were at the point where the building was going to be condemned in order, and they were going to have nowhere to be, right? And so um, this... The, the Lord just pressed upon her dad that um, he he needed to fast until the Lord provided, and so he he met with his doctor, began to do um, these things, and he fasted. Um, and his plan to start with was forty days, and he did a forty day fast. Um, and he went and he did this forty day fast, and on the fortieth day. A man, unbeknownst to anyone in the church, zero connections to the church at all, walked into the office, said, hey, um, I need to give some money for tax purposes, and um, I don't want it going anywhere, and I just felt like the Lord told me I needed to come to this place specifically and give you guys a check. And, and she, I mean, she's just sitting there crying and bawling because she, she was in high school when all of this happened. And so she was very real to her. And, and she said, our whole family thought my dad was crazy, like, for doing this. Because it was like, Dad, like, we're all sitting around eating, and my dad's just kind of staring at us, drinking his water, you know. And um, this man, and she said her dad was just kind of like, okay. And... and that man sat there and wrote a check to cover the new building and then like salaries for the next year. And, and, and I mean, he's like, he's like, her dad just wept and wept and wept and wept on the 40th day. Like there's no coincidence in that. That's the Lord moving and working. And so, um, you know, fasting um, is... Taking guidance from the Lord and what the Lord is doing, and um, you know, I, I'll, I'll never forget that story. And, and listening to um, her tell that story from a very real, firsthand experience of walk, watching her dad walk through that um, was just—it was just remarkable. Um, but his, you know, his, his reliance. She said, "What, what, what?" She learned from it the most was watching her dad's reliance upon the Lord to sustain him. He literally had nothing else sustaining him other than the Lord. And she's like, I just, it just spoke volumes to me 
as not only as a believer, but all, as 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 a child watching my dad rely so solely upon the Lord. And so, um, uh, anyways, so um, <clears throat> New Testament fasting, um, Day of Atonement, again, no no different, right? We move we move into uh, we, we, we move in the New Testament and, and there's still, um, you know, at this point, the, the Jews have gotten more and more um, almost legalistic about all of these things. Uh, not almost, they have gotten legalistic about it. And they've also gotten very pious about it. And they've gotten very, um, look at me about it, right? <laughs> and so it, it, fasting has become more and more... Um, uh, Interesting as in, in as far as the Pharisee Sadducee thing goes. So in Luke eighteen, we'll, we'll, we get to Acts in a minute. But Luke eighteen, uh, eleven and twelve says this: the Pharisee standing by himself prayed this: God, I think I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes to all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. And so what we see there is this Pharisee saying, hey, I, I, I fast twice a week. They fasted typically on Monday and Thursday, and what would it be our week? That would that was the days they fasted, um, and so we see this kind of like "look at me, look at me" mentality of fasting uh, playing out. And then, um, and if you even look in Luke chapter two, um, verses thirty-six and thirty-seven, it says this: and there was a prophetess Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at the <clears throat> that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of Him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. <coughs> so we see even in the prophetess, Anna, um, in, in the really, you know, in the birth of Jesus and how this plays out is that um, we even see her fasting, right? It's just a, a common occurrence that they're, that's happening. And then in Acts 27, um, Acts 27, verse 9, since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous, because even the fast was already over. Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be <clears throat> with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. And so Paul even speaks of this fasting that's already happening, right? And so they're doing this on a regular basis. Um, we see Jesus fasted. Matthew chapter 4, somebody looked that one up. Matthew chapter 4. I know we're kind of rolling through this, but I want you to see this. Matthew chapter 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Right. So we see Jesus himself did what? He fasted. Mm -hmm. Right? He fasted and relied upon... The Lord relied upon um, the word of the Lord. And so we, we see that he fasted. Um, and then Jesus assumed his disciples did and would fast. If you look with me in Matthew chapter 6, verse 16, it says this. And when you fast, <laughs> so that's the interesting thing. It's like, he, it wasn't like, um, there's no like commandment that as believers that, uh, you should fast, right? But there's this assumption that we do and we will, right? And when you fast, it's not like a suggestion, right? It's like when you fast, 
Do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Is that we don't fast so that others know, right? Um, and, you know, in our culture, it's so hard because, like, you, you fast, and, and, of course, that if you choose to fast that day, of course, that's the day everybody texts you and calls you, hey, you want to go to lunch? Hey, you want to go to dinner tonight? Hey, you want to do this? Like, uh, well, uh, well, uh, you know, because you don't want to be like, well, I'm fasting. I cannot, you know, <laughs> but um, it's, 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 that, it's that temptation of, of, because our culture is, our culture is built around food in a lot of ways, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Like, like, you know, there's, out of like all the businesses coming to Burleson, like probably every, for every three businesses that are coming to Burleson, two of them are food restaurants, food places, right? Or they, or, or they have, they offer food in some, and so our culture, so much of our culture is built around food. And so I think sometimes it's hard for us as believers um, you know, it's, we got to be intentional when we talk about that. Um, so, and then we see in the New Testament that leaders of the church fasted um, when choosing missionaries and elders um, in Acts 13. Um, you know, I, this is, this, I was, I was looking at this today and I was like, man, this is fascinating because I'm not sure that, um, I'm not sure that this is, mm, practice that's probably been practiced since the early church like we don't do this like instead of instead of fasting for new ministers to come to the church or sending out new missionaries we feed them <laughs> right you think about that when a, when a, when a new pastor or new minister comes to a church what do we do man there's like seven meals planned that weekend Right, but but look what look what happens in Acts chapter thirteen. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers: Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, a member of the court of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord, <coughs> Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, "Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them." Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So there's, um, there's this, this precedence where they sit and say, hey, we're going to pray for fast. And in the praying and the fasting, the Spirit's going to move. Isn't that interesting? Mm-hmm. Um, and then if we look at 14, 23, by the way, um, at this point, um, in chapter 13, halfway through chapter 13, there's a shift. It was Saul, it was Barnabas and Saul, because Barnabas was the, the original church planter. Barnabas was the original encourager, the original kind of one. And halfway through chapter 13, it swaps to Saul and Barnabas, because the baton is being passed. Right? It's this, this shift that happens... Because um, Saul hasn't become Paul yet, but it's this shift that happens where now um, it's not Barnabas and Saul, it's now Paul and Barnabas, right? It's the shift that happens um, in that. But chapter, that was free, sorry. Chapter 14, verse 23. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And so they, they um, committed to, to, to prayer and fasting. Um, there's, um, uh, there's, a, there's a guy out there named Mark Deaver. He's a pastor in Washington, D.C. And he's a proponent of any time a church hires a pastor, they should pray and fast. Uh, they should pray for six weeks and their church, somebody in their church should one, at least one person every week should fast um, uh, every week for six weeks before they say yes to a new pastor. So he should come, he can do a call, he should preach. Um, 
if that's how it's set up, because he doesn't, he believes in um, secession. So he he believes that you know, if you have a pastor, that pastor should be always mentoring and discipling somebody, so that when he's done, that next person steps in, and you know, the church is never left without leadership. But it says in the case that it that's not the case, then what you should do is the church should pray and fast for six weeks after they've heard the man preach, after they've met the man, before he comes and they say yes to him. Well, that's the exact opposite of what we do, right? We don't do that at all. <clears throat> and I was, it's, I was like, wow, that's, that's interesting. But um, uh, that's, we, we see that and we see this, this idea of leaders, you know, praying, leaders in the church praying and fasting um, before anything, decisions are made. So, so how do we practice this discipline? Um, how long should a fast be? Well, the Bible doesn't give any commands about length. Um, and in, in our, I typed all that out for you. It includes fasts that cover part of, of a day, one day, three days, seven days, 21 days, and then the supernatural fast of, of, of 40 days. Uh, the Bible also records fasts without mentioning their length. Um, I gave you all the scripture references to that. So we don't have a specific time frame, right? Um, there, are, there are partial fasts, right? Um, a lot of times people call a partial fast uh, uh, the, the, the sun up to sundown would be a partial fast. Uh, you have an extended fast. You know, like a half fast where you're fasting um, for a day, or you have a full fast where you're not fasting for seven days or whatever. Um, and, you know, we don't have anywhere in Scripture that says you should fast this long. Um, but it is, it is a good um, practice for us as believers to get into of fasting. Um, and we'll specifically talk about why um, in just a minute. But... Who should participate in the fast? Well, we have, there's, there's, it, there's, um, there's evidence for private fasts, for small groups, um, and then also for congregational, um, where uh, the whole group of people did it, right? I um, gave you those scripture verses. I'm not going to read them all. I'm assuming you can go read them um, just for the sake of time tonight. But um, we have, uh, you know, where you, by yourself, there's a precedence in Scripture that says, hey, you by yourself can fast. Um, and then where small groups could fast together and say, hey, we're, we're going to fast together um, because maybe, maybe this, this small group member is walking through something. Hey, we're going to fast together um, and pray as a reminder. Um, and one of the things that I, I've learned about fasting is that um, during those times when, when a normal meal would be, I spend that time praying, right? Um, if your meal takes 30 minutes to eat on any given day, right? If you, if you take 30 minutes for lunch, you take an hour for lunch, uh, you spend that time just praying. Um, spending time with the Lord and praying. Um, and, and so, but uh, who should participate in the fast? You got those there. Should Christian fast? <laughs> yes but always for the right reasons, okay? Uh, that's crucial in understanding uh, as believers why we should fast, okay? Uh, I think sometimes um, it's not always, our hearts are not always truthful with us, right? So we can say out loud, I'm fasting, because this is what I'm supposed to do or because I'm doing this. But in reality, something else is going on. It's like, well, I'm going to fast. I'm going to lose a couple pounds, right? <laughs> I, I, may, I, this, the, I, I may gain a result from the fast, right? And we have to really step back and go, hey, what's motivating my fast? What's motivating the reason for me fasting? Uh, because I think fasting is a foreign idea for most of us. It's not a common practice that most of us just put into our daily rhythm. Maybe you do. I, it's not a common rhythm for our family. 
right, um, Logan? Could you agree? Um, like I, I would, I would think that you know, and it's you know, it's it's tough too because you look at, uh, I mean, when you have kids, you have a family, you have kids. Like I don't know about your house, but my house, it's nonstop. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. You literally just ate the entire meal we just cooked. Like all of it, it's gone. And you're hungry. You're going to the pantry. You're hungry. Sutton got in the car today. Like she literally had a snack in the morning, lunch, snack in the afternoon, gets in the truck, and she's like, I'm hungry. I, gave, I brought a snack. I was on it. Gave it to her. Finished it. Daddy, I'm still hungry. I was on it. Gave her another snack. Gave her water. Daddy, I'm still hungry. Then she starts getting angry. Like mad at me, yelling at me, because I won't give her anything else. I'm like, kid, like, you know? But all I say is like we we in our culture just struggle with kind of that idea of fasting. Because I you know I told my kids, hey, we're fasting today, they might eat me. <laughs> I don't know. Like they may <laughs> eat me. <laughs> so <laughs> um, but I think it's really important for us to understand that that as believers, we we have to fast for the right reasons, um, because and it and it can be for and we're going to get to 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 those the reasons to fasting in a minute. But um, I gave you some some text. Somebody look up First Timothy four one through five um, for us real quick. Anybody got it? No, the Spirit expressively says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirit and teaching of demons. Through the incest, incest, oh, whatever, <laughs> liars, <laughs> insincerity of liars who consist, whose consciences are seared who forbid marriages and require abstinence from food that God created to be received within thanks, with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Yeah. So, so what that text is referring to is that um, within, within, the, within even the early church, um, there was this kind of, um, uh, you know, and, and God, God gives this vision to Peter early on, where Peter's on the roof and and um, these and this is an axe and and these sheets come down and all these different types of food are on these sheets and uh, unclean and clean and then Peter and then God tells Peter what what I have made who are you to call unclean what I have made clean and it's Peter's call to go where to the Gentiles right it's Peter's call to go to the Gentiles because prior to that. Peter's like, I'm a Jew, and I'm not. And even after that call, like, there's a, at one point that that Paul has to call Peter out because Peter is even like he's he's coming to the church, he loves the Gentiles, but then there's a moment where Peter kind of withdraws from the Gentiles, he kind of starts congregating with the Jews again, is like, nah, nah, nah. and Paul calls Peter out about it, and um, but there's there's this again this idea within the church. Um, because you had Jews and Gentiles, right? And the Gentiles were willing to eat everything. And the Jews are still over here going, yeah, but all of my life I couldn't eat that. You know, and so there's this, this kind of this mentality with fasting going, well, I refrain from those things. I fast from those things. So it somehow kind of made them better. Better. Huh? Holier. Right. Um, same thing happens in Colossians. We see in Colossians chapter 2 and in verse 20, it says this. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to the things that all per perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. So, <coughs> um, <clears throat> John Piper 
who's a, a, a pastor and theologian um, in Minnesota, does a, does a lot of really good um, study on this, this passage and in the passages of Matthew. talks about how um, just in, in the New Testament times, they would, this fasting was about kind of, um, look at me, I'm, I'm fasting, and because I'm fasting and I'm refraining from these things, I'm better than you, right? And he, and he says, he says, we have to be very careful and very leery of our own hearts when we do fast. Because remember, I talked about our, our minds can tell us one thing and our heart, we, we try to justify some things, but when we fast, we have to be very careful within that fast that to, to not trick ourselves, right? Because our hearts will always do what? They'll lie to us, right? They will. But, but in that fast, not get to this point, we see in the New Testament where we're going, hey, I'm, I'm better than Sean because, well, I fasted today. Like, and we, we may not have that literal thought, right? Um, it's more like, I'm better than Sean because I have more hair, but... Uh, like, we may not have that. We may not have those literal thoughts, but there's some sense of for us that goes. I'm doing good. It's a comparison game, really, at the end of the day, um, and so so we have to be very careful when we talk about should Christians fast. Yes, but we need to make sure we're doing it with a right heart. So reasons to fast, and then we'll be done. Um, to strengthen our prayer life, um, gave you Ezra. 821 and that's the passage that um, Sean read earlier where um, he's asking for for guidance he's asking for um, uh, to, to wait on the Lord right and so it's to strengthen our prayer life it's, and so I told you earlier is that when we fast in those times that we're refraining and abstaining from food is that we pray in those times and I don't I don't think there's any of us in the room that couldn't benefit from our prayer life being strengthened Right, um, and and so we we fast for those reasons. For that's a, a reason to seek God's guidance. Um, Judges twenty, um, verse twenty through or verse twenty six. We read that earlier. Um, to seek God's guidance um, is that that I I don't know about you, but you know, and I love the old the old hymn. I need thee every hour, oh Lord, I need thee, um, because. We do. I, I need God's guidance every moment. Um, and we all do. And so we fast for to seek God's guidance in specific situations and specific circumstances. Um, and every single one of us have those circumstances probably going on right now. You know, well, if not, they're coming. <laughs> That's just how life works, doesn't it? And, and we need God's guidance in all of that. Um, and then uh, to seek deliverance or protection. Now, um, one of the things that we need to be careful with this is that not all, every time we fast is not going to, to mean deliverance. It's not going to mean protection every time we fast, right? But oftentimes when we fast, it is a, um, it's a, it's a, a, to seek that. Lord, we need you. Because what does it do? It puts, um, when we see, when we fast and we seek the Lord for the deliverance or protection, what happens is it changes our perspective on the circumstance, right? When we seek the Lord in prayer and we fast and we come before Him, it changes our perspective about what's really going on. So um, 2 Chronicles uh, 22 through 4 says this, Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a great multitude is coming against you from Edom, from beyond the sea, and behold, they are in Hazazan Tamar, that is, in Gedi. Then Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face, face to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Right, and, and so then it, the fast stirred something in everyone to do what? Seek the Lord. 
right? In that moment, they realized what? Above all, they didn't need to get ready for a battle. Above all, they needed to do what? Seek the Lord. Change the perspective, didn't it? Okay. <clears throat> so then the, second one, the next one, express grief. Uh, we see that in, in 2 Samuel um, chapter 1, 11 and 12. We read those verses already. As it ex expresses grief, um, there's, there's moments where um, we need to fast because it puts us before the Lord to grieve something that's going on in our life. To grieve uh, the things that we've lost. To grieve the things that um, may be coming. Um, to grieve the things that um, maybe in our own lives that we just need to grieve. Um, maybe the grief of our own sin. Right? Um, and then um, express repentance and return to God. Uh, if we look at Joel um, chapter 2. Verse 12, it says this. And even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Right? It's that the, 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 the Lord sends this word to, to, to the people is that return to him. And, and within fasting, we do that. It's a repentance and a, a return to, to, to the Lord. It's to humble ourselves before the Lord. Um, in in First Kings, um, we see this. First Kings chapter twenty one. And when Ahab heard those words, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth on his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth. And went about dejectedly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Have you seen how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me. I will not bring the disaster in his days, but in his son's days, I will bring the disaster upon his house. So fasting allows us to humble ourselves before the Lord because we need him, right? Um, we need the Lord. And so fasting. Um, there's a reason we need to humble ourselves before the Lord. Express concern for the work of God. Um, we've seen in Daniel chapter 9 where um, and, and Daniel is praying for God's people as that he is literally going before the Lord, asking the Lord to do these things. Um, and so um, expressing um, concern for the work of God. And then the last thing is this, is that Minister to the needs of others. Um, in Isaiah um, chapter 58, um, verses 6 and 7 says this, Is not this the fast that I chose, that I choose, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke, is it not to share your bread, <clears throat> to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and do not hide yourself from your own flesh? Is it we fast for um, so that we can minister to the needs of others? Um, oftentimes when we um, come into a fast and we come into these moments where we're praying and we're seeking the Lord, our eyes are opened to the things that are going on around us. We become more sensitive and we become more in tune with the things going on and the needs going on around us. It's fascinating how when we, when we fast and we pray and we seek the Lord with a right heart, in those moments, we stop thinking about our own needs and we start seeing the needs of others. And ultimately, fasting for us as believers is about that. It's getting our minds off of ourselves and on the Lord. Because that's what all of our Christian life is about. It's to make sure that we focus on Him.
Thoughts, questions? I know that was a lot, but we got through it. You know, Brandon, I noticed a lot of times it, it says it says they tore their clothes. What, what what's the symbolism in in that? Why, yeah. Why, why, why they? Yeah, we see David doing that. We see a lot of the kings doing that. Um, that was a um, that was a symbolism of saying I'm. I'm tearing away, because oftentimes they would tear away and then they would cover themselves in ashes. We see this in, um, in, in the book of Jonah with basically all of Nineveh. <laughs> when Jonah warns them, they basically all tear their clothes and cover themselves in ashes. Um, it was a symbolism of tearing down what, what has caused the sin, what has caused that. We're tearing that away we're, we're, and we're going into mourning. Right, and so it was a symbolism of a show of I'm ripping away what has been done, and I'm going into mourning and grief over what I have done. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's um, the thing. And, yeah, and so um, that's where you see Ahab doing it. David does it multiple times. Um, all of Nineveh does it and over and over with all, a lot of the, the kings of Israel and Judah. We see that is that they tear their clothes, and it's a it's a sign of we are broken. We need, we need to get rid of what has been done. So, yeah. Good question, though. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I've got a buddy of mine who fasted. And he's like, during the fast, God said, Hey, you're dying of hunger right now. Like, you feel like you just can't go forward because I'm just so famished. He says, what do you think your spiritual body feels like because you don't pray and you don't seek me? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. True story. Yeah. We fast spiritually a lot, don't we? Yes, we do. <laughs> Without end. Without end. And think it's okay. Mm -hmm. You know? Sure.